I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our program um, discussing social media due diligence. My name is Max So, and I'm an associate with our corporate section at Williams Mullen, and I am based in our Richmond office. I focus my practice on corporate and administrative regulatory matters, and the majority of my practice relates to helping com clients comply with and thrive within federal, state, and local regulatory schemes governing um, industries such as marketing, online retailing, consumer financial services, and other industries governed by agencies such as the FTC, FDA, ATF, ABC, TTV, and CFPB, among others. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Amber Duncan. Thanks, Max. So I am Amber Duncan. I'm a partner in our firm. I love working with Max and others on our team to handle anything that has to do with helping a business comply with regulatory, corporate, advertising, tax, licensing issues. We regularly help um, with new business launch, helping to sell a company, help purchase a company, and all the online and in-person, particularly tax, advertising, promotional issues. I'm very happy to be here with you today. I'm just going to talk on um, some statistics on the use of social media. Um, over 5 billion people use social media worldwide, and on average, they're using between six and seven different platforms every month. And over 97% of the Fortune 500 uses social media. How and why do companies use social media? They use them in several um, different ways. There's marketing and public relations. Social media is used to increase brand awareness, to promote goods and services, to obtain customer feedback, and actually, and to do damage control after you know something um, negative appears in the news. They also use social media for business to business and internally for networking, information gathering, and um, employment issues. Either way, the goal for using social media is to increase brand equity. So social media can be used to increase brand equity, increase goodwill, and make more money. So the real question is, why are customers willing to pay higher prices for brand name items over cheaper non-branded goods? And the answer is brand equity and is brand equity. And there's a quick note on brand equity and goodwill. Brand equity is the value of a brand in the minds of consumers based on their perceptions of the brand's attributes. Brand equity is a combination of a brand's reputation, customer loyalty, and brand awareness. And a strong brand's equity can lead to higher prices and revenues. Now, goodwill includes brand equity, but it's the value of a company that's all of its intangible assets, such as customer loyalty and reputation. And goodwill is created when a company buys another company for more of the value, for more than the value of the acquired company's assets. And goodwill can be really an important asset for a company as it leads to super profits that are higher than what could be expected from the company's tangible assets alone. So for example, when Amazon acquired Whole Foods, they allocated $9 billion to Goodwill, and that was 70% of the purchase price. So you can see that there's value of Goodwill and creating Goodwill through brand equity. Okay, so I'll talk over about what is this social media due diligence? At first, you might be questioning, this is just Facebook, uh, some advertising, everyone does it. Why is it such a big deal? But we've seen when working with our corporate partners how important it is because in the last slide, Max talked about, I mean, for the Amazon Whole Foods purchase, that was 70% of the purchase price was this goodwill, these intangibles. And so much in our digital age is wrapped up in your social media presence, as well as other e-commerce advertising. So why that's very exciting, and we're seeing just more and more of um, this value being attributed to companies and important. There are so many pitfalls that folks often don't think about. And it's just so important to, if you are purchasing uh, the company, to evaluate that compliance of the potential target before it becomes a problem. So many folks don't get to this until the integration part because they don't realize compliance with FTC issues, um, compliance with intellectual property, especially when you get into generative AI and disruptive technologies, the risk of non-compliance, what that takes. So it's really important to take the time to identify and address these legal risks on the front end. And so we've had fun because this is our bread and butter. We love all things social media, all things regulatory. And in talking to our corporate partners, well, how can we start you know, back in the due diligence phase to really assist in valuing the company and identifying any uh, landmines? So some of the potential landmines I men mentioned are content control and ownership. You want to understand, is it uh, content that the company 
is putting out there? Are there any third party infringement issues? Are they using user generated content, which many companies use? And that's when you're taking, you're asking your customers to submit videos, uh, photos, anything that they're creating and make sure that you have the proper uh, license or authority to use that. Privacy considerations is a huge one. Making sure that all the information you're gathering, whether it be through social media, through sweepstakes, just through advertising online, use of cookies and so forth, that you're complying with these privacy laws, um, which is a huge issue and a huge area of litigation that we're seeing. So like the intellectual property issues, if there's any defamation issues, whether it be on the corporate level or internally, um, the employment and workplace issues, is there, what are you doing to monitor your employees? Um, will their social media use ever be attributed to the company? Um, for instance, FTC says, if it's an endorsement, if they got any consideration from the company, it's like the company saying it itself. So uh, a big case a while back was when PlayStation gave out a bunch of different games to its employees and it was out there trying to drum up good news about it. But the FTC felt that because there was that consideration, they were giving them this, this new product to use. It was basically as the company was saying it themselves. And then there are your employees complying with all the FTC requirements. Um, there's certainly additional risks for certain regulated industries. Um, we have a lot of experience with public companies. The SEC has um, actually quite a bit of guidance on social media and when it needs to be included. Do you need to, you know, file um, press releases? Do you need, if someone says something on um, social media, does that have to be reported? Highly regulated industries, especially age-gated products, um, alcohol, tobacco, lottery, uh, cannabis. Um, there are platform-specific requirements. We work with a lot of those really regulated industries and making sure that they're complying with not only the FTC and many state FTC laws, but the platforms themselves put requirements on all this advertising or contests, um, as well as, of course, um, financial industries. And um, then the kind of the catch all the advertising issues with FTC. So I feel like everyone loves a good war story. And this is to be like, this really is a big deal. And this is why this is important. Not paying attention to the changes in the platform policies. And just two years ago, Facebook faced an estimated $10 billion loss when Apple updated its privacy policy to reduce the advertiser's ability to target consumers. So failures to comply with the policies, but here Facebook wasn't, can cause a target company to be um, deplatformed. So this is something we're constantly talking to our clients about, that it may not be necessarily a legal risk, but if they take down your web page, your branded page on any of these platforms, that can be devastating for a company. The influencer-based advertising, which is huge and keeps growing, especially with the influx of NIL money, and um, just the use of influencers may expose a company to huge liabilities because like we said, the FTC said it's basically, if you have an influencer out there saying something, it's the same thing as if your company was saying it. This was the huge privacy breach by Starwood Hotels. They had experienced a data breach um, due to inadequate cybersecurity. And when Marriott um, acquired them, it exposed them to huge liabilities. So these are big numbers and big things to think about on the front end. So we'll go quickly through what traditional due diligence is. And then these slides will be emailed to you afterwards. So you can see type of language we suggest adding to due diligence, what you should be asking for to possibly discover these issues. So Max, I'll turn it over. Sorry, I've left very little time. <laughs> Traditional due diligence requests may include, you know, requests for marketing materials and press releases, but um, you got to be asking yourself, what else should you be asking for to understand the target social media um, and advertising assets? And what should you try to independently review? And how do you use third-party vendors? There are just, you know, there are third-party vendors that specialize in this now, the deep, the deep dig on social media as part of your due diligence. So you should request a list of the social media sites currently or previously used by your target company. The login information, um, for example, the username and password to each social media account, um, a list of representatives of the target with access to such accounts, 
From a description of the target company's use of social media sites, and to the extent available, all the files of the target company's social media officer. And you should also request information on the data privacy collection and handling practices of your target company. So what information is gathered from customers and how is it stored, used, and shared? Um, data privacy policies and disclosures, information security policies and procedures, and compliance with data privacy laws, such as um, the EU's GDPR, California CCPA, and other industry-specific policies. So we would um, also, you also want to review social media postings by employees of the target. A potential buyer of a business should also pay close attention to the use of Max, oh, yeah. I think since we're running so, um, 15 minutes goes by very quickly. Everyone's going to get a copy of this for the additional requests that you can make, but just showing you the type of questions that you should be asking. Sorry to take over, Max, but so these are the type of questions you should be asking. We are happy to help. Um, of course, it would be um, you, it would be different depending on the company or the situation. We also do not even in, with the M&A transaction, but we can help review. We do many audits of companies, of clients, social media to make sure that they're compliant as well. So that's the type of things you may want to think about to protect your company or brand. If anyone has any other questions, please reach out to us. I'm happy to help. But once you get those materials, if you have any questions, please just let us know. Thank you so much.